Saturday. So uh, I want to take just a moment to introduce my friend Jay. Jay, you want to come on up here, man? Uh, this, is, uh, this is Jay Nicholas. Uh, Jay and Shelly have joined us uh, all the way over from Peoria, Illinois. Man, what a drive. Uh, just uh, uh, It was a journey to get here. So uh, Jay is a, a good friend, a mentor of mine. Um, if you don't know Jay, uh, Jay really helped coach us through our, our church planting process. So uh, you don't know it, but you owe a lot to Jay. So, um, and he's going to be very humble about about it, but um, uh, just very thankful for this man and, and excited for him to share uh, from, from God's word with us. So can I pray for you, Jay? Jesus, thank you uh, just for uh, Jay and, and Shelly and their family. Thank you for uh, just the investment that they've sown into so many lives in the kingdom uh, through the work of evangelism, through the work of church planting. Uh, we just ask that as he shares with us this morning, um, God, you would help shape and mold who we are as followers of Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, God, and that we would respond uh, to the truth that's shared. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, good morning, Pathway Church. It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning. It always is. We absolutely love coming here. And so uh, any time that uh, Tanner gives me a call and says, hey, can you pinch hit? It's like, absolutely, if, if at all possible. Now, this is, this is what was really cool, though, is uh, so Tanner tells me, he says, uh, hey, we are in a series here before Easter, uh, heading up to Easter. I said, well, where are you at? And he goes, we're, we're in the book of Philippians. And, um, and Tanner, I think, knew some of this, but if there was only one book in the Bible or one letter in the Bible that I love more than any other book. It is Philippians. I mean, I love this book. In fact, I literally, when I wake up every morning, the first thing that hits my eyes um, is Philippians, especially chapter three. It is my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. And, uh, and I'd, I'd probably be okay if it was the only book in the Bible. I just love it so much. And so uh, I, I get the privilege of being able to share with you this morning uh, just a little bit uh, from Philippians chapter 3. So some of you might have heard the story um, about the husband and wife who had the same birthdays. And they were celebrating their 60th birthday. And they were visited by an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord looked at him and said, on your 60th birthday, I'm here to grant you anything you want. And he looked at the husband. He said, what would you want more than anything? The husband thought about it for just a little bit. And he says, I got it. I know what I want. I want my wife to be 20 years younger than me. And the angel looks at him. He says, are, are you sure that's what you really? He goes, you told me I could have anything I wanted. So yes, I want my wife to be 20 years younger than me. And so the angel of the Lord says, okay, your wish is granted. And he made the man 80 years old. <laughs> what about you? What, if, if, if an angel of the Lord appeared to you this morning or, or this afternoon and said, what do you want? Anything. What would it be? Maybe some of us would want our health. That would be a good thing. Maybe some of us would want the strength of our youth again. Maybe some of us would want the maturity of, of being older and wiser. Maybe some of us would say, I want to be famous. And maybe some of us would say, I'd really kind of like to win that lottery right now. <laughs> I find it noteworthy that this question of what do you want is a theme that runs throughout the scriptures. For instance, in the Old Testament, we see where God appears to Solomon and asks him, what would you like? What would you want? In the New Testament, we see where Jesus asks his disciples, what do you want? We also see another place where Bartimaeus approaches him and, and Jesus asks him the same question. What do you want? What do you desire? Well, while imprisoned and, and chained between two Praetorian guards 24-7, interestingly enough, 
the Apostle Paul basically says that there is something that he would love more than anything else. Paul wrote several letters to the churches that he had established while he was in prison. In fact, one of the letters was written to the church at Philippi, which we now recognize as the letter of Philippians or the book of Philippians in the New Testament. What makes this letter so different, though, from all of the others is how personal it is. See, Paul reveals some of his most personal thoughts. In fact, by the time we get to the middle of the letter in the third chapter, we find that Paul is revealing his deepest desire or the thing that he wants more than anything else in life. And it's recorded in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, before we start kind of rolling our eyes and stating the obvious, like, well, of course, he's an apostle. Why wouldn't he want this? Um, remember, he's writing this letter from a detained and chained prison as a prisoner. And yet, nowhere does he say uh, in this letter, that the thing that he wants the most in life is to be set free from his chains. Nowhere does he ask God to miraculously loose the chains like he did earlier when he and Silas were put in prison. But what he does say, in my opinion, is nothing short of remarkable when he says, I want to know Christ. Now, can we just kind of park it right there just for a minute. Paul writes, I want to know him. Now, now is it only me but, that, that thinks this, but does anyone else who reads this man's story think that, man, if there were ever a person that knew Christ, it, would, it was Paul. I mean, you could probably throw Peter and James and John in there too, but if anyone knew Jesus, it was Paul. And yet, he writes, I want to know Christ. Why would he write that? Why would he say that? Now, this is where two specific things kind of come into play here. Number one, this is where the meaning of this passage kind of gets lost in translation. Number two, this is where I get to justify spending thousands and thousands of dollars by studying three years of Greek, okay? And for those of you who are unfamiliar or, or maybe uninitiated, the New Testament was written in the common, or they called it the Koine Greek of Paul's day. That's what everybody used basically uh, in, in the Roman world, it was the Koine Greek. It was meant to be understood. And so in this language that, that Paul spoke and, and Paul used, when Paul uses the word know, K-N-O-W, when he says, I want to know Christ, it meant something a little different than what we might understand to mean today. For instance, if I asked you this morning, how many of you know Pastor Tanner Smith? You'd say, well, yeah, sure, I, I, know, I know Pastor Tanner. Um, and yet, do you really know him? Do you really know that he used to eat nine eggs for breakfast in the morning. I mean, do you really know him? Because there are levels of knowing him, right? And I'm, I, this could be a guess, but I'm guessing that my level of knowing him is not even close to the level that his wife, Alexa, knows him. I mean, she's got the goods on him. And I'm guessing that, that his brother probably has some goods on him too. And so if we're really nice to them, we might be able to get them to come up here this morning and tell a couple of, no, just, just, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> you see, I think it's safe to say that Alexa does know him on a much deeper level. And that's exactly what Paul is stating in this passage. His greatest desire 
is to know Christ at the deepest level possible. He doesn't want to just know about Christ. This word, this Greek word gnosko, it literally means to experience. He wanted to experience Christ. And in this, these short two verses this morning, he shows us four distinct ways that every one of us can experience Christ. And the first way that he says that we can experience Christ is we can experience, in, we can experience him personally, on a personal level. Now, let that sink in for just a moment. You and I can experience the Son of God on a personal level. We do not have to live vicariously through a person, a priest, or a pastor. We get to experience him person to person. We call this having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul says that's how we can know him. In this same chapter, Paul tells us that formally he was, very, he was a deeply devoted religious person. He kept the rules. He performed the rituals. He adhered to all of the religious regulations. In fact, Paul saw it as his religious duty to hunt down the early followers of Christ and put them in prison for abandoning the Jewish religious customs and traditions. But on one particular hunting excursion, Paul had an encounter that changed his mind, his heart, and his lifelong pursuit of religion. You see, Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He described it to the Philippians as Christ taking hold of him. That all the while that he was pursuing Christians to take hold of them and imprison them, Jesus was pursuing him. And Jesus caught him. And when Jesus caught him, Saul, who later became Paul, became a believer in the one that he was persecuting others for believing in. Only God can do that. Only God can save those that we think are unsavable. Paul, Saul became Paul. He became a believer. Jesus personally pursued Saul, and when he caught him, that's when the personal relationship with Christ began. Something changed inside of him. Something was very different. In fact, Paul would later describe it to the, to the church at Corinth and say, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You see, when Paul met Christ, he lost his religion. <laughs> and that was a good thing. You see... Christianity is not about religion. I heard a guy say one time that the difference between religion and Christianity is this. Religion is spelled D-O. It's all the things that we try to do to make ourselves presentable before God. That, that's what Paul did. He did all the quote-unquote right things. In fact, he lists his pedigree in the first part of chapter 3 and says, Look, I, I did all these religious things. I was from the, the, the right heritage and everything. But all of that, I now consider rubbish. And if you want to do a very interesting word study on a word, I dare you to do a word study on the word rubbish, okay? Um, we won't go there this morning, but, but Paul's basically saying it's, it's a pile of, of garbage. Um, yeah, exactly. Religion is spelled Dio, all the things we try to do to make ourselves presentable to God. But Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. It's what Christ has already done for us to save us from our sins. And Paul began that personal relationship with Christ. Experiencing Christ personally is just the start. Just as it was just the start for Paul, it's just the start for you and I. Because according to Paul, there's another way that we can experience Christ. And that is, we can experience him powerfully. Notice what he says with me in verse 10. How he wants to know Christ or experience Christ. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. 
Now, for some of you, this is going to be worth the price of admission this morning. Listen to this. If Jesus was raised from the dead, and I fully believe he is, it changes everything. And I mean everything. It means that he really is the son of God. And and one of the best prayers in the entire New Testament is Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus, starting in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Listen to how Paul prays for these people. He says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. There's that word again, that you may experience him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Wait for it, here it is. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but in the one to come. The Holy Spirit prompted Paul to write these words because he wants us to know that we too can experience this incomparably great resurrection power in our lives. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that that filled the believers on the day of Pentecost. The same power that is promised to every person who believes and receives Christ. John said it this way, to all who received him, to all, believed, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right, and that word literally means he gave them the power to become children of God. You see, if you have experienced the new birth in Christ, then the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives within you. Man, think about that. Resurrection power lives within us. Now, that's a startling statement, but it's true. And there's absolutely nothing or no one greater than the power of God that lives within us. John goes goes as far as to tell us that he who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Isn't that that good news? Isn't it good good news that there's, there's, there's there's, there's absolutely nothing in this world is greater than the power that lives within those who know him and who have experienced the new birth. And if you've never experienced the new birth, we're going to tell you how to do that before we go today. Paul tells us in Philippians 4.13, very familiar passage of scripture for most of us, says, I can do all things through Christ. Who does what? Who gives me strength. Where does this strength come from? It comes from the power of his resurrection. This phrase, give me strength, literally means empowering. In other words, no matter what people, Satan, or life threw at him, Paul declared that Christ was continually empowering him to be able to handle it. Isn't that good news? No matter what this world throws at us, and it's throwing a lot at us right now, isn't it? Greater is the one who is in me than the one who's in the world. No matter what Satan tries to throw at you, Christ gives you strength to handle it. No matter what your mother-in-law... No, we won't go there. Um, (laughs) Just kidding. No matter what people throw at you. And you know, there there are evil people in this world. Very, very evil people who are now calling evil good and good evil. No matter what they throw at us, We can handle it. Why? Because Christ is empowering us and giving us strength to be able to do all things through him. So here's a really big question that I keep asking myself, and I wonder if you can relate to it. If Christ's resurrection power is available to us, then how do I apply 
and appropriate that power in my life. I mean, if, if that power is there, that resurrection power, that, which that's what Paul's saying here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. How do I apply it? I think the scriptures answer that. And I think it's found in that prayer in Ephesians where Paul says this. His incomparably great power for us who believe. There it is. God's power is activated by belief, by faith. Trusting in him, his work on the cross, his word. Please hear me out. I'm not advocating some type of name it and claim it type of faith, but rather I'm advocating what I believe the Bible says is a believe no matter what kind of faith. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. And no matter how bad it can get, how tough it can get, here's what I know. I always remind myself, he's still on the cross. I love that we sing that, that old hymn, Because He Lives. Thank you, worship team. Because he lives, because he was raised from the dead, you know what? I'm going to win no matter what. Why should I fear what people can do to me? I'm going to fear the one who made me and loved me and gave himself for me. Interestingly enough, I believe in a, in a believe no matter what type of faith. Believe that no matter what the circumstances that I'm facing, he has my best interest in mind. And there are times when God will instantaneously change your circumstances, right? Don't you love that? Don't you love it when God does that? I mean, he just, I mean, he gets you over it, man. I mean, it's done. Love those times. And he, he can change circumstances. He can change situations. He can change environments. But you know what I found out? Most of the time, he uses those circumstances to change me. And maybe you're facing something right now, and you're wondering, man, God, where are you? I'll tell you where he's at. He's never left. In fact, he promised, I'll never leave you or forsake you, ever. You have to trust him. Amen. Even when it hurts, even when it's difficult. You see, God loves us just as we are, like someone said, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He wants us to grow in him. Paul says, we have this resurrection power living right within us. Now, there's another little secret about God's power that I would be remiss if I didn't pass on to you, and that is that not only is God's power activated by faith, but it works best in our weaknesses. Now, we think just the opposite, don't we? We think, oh man, when I'm bold and I'm confident and I'm declaring things out of the word of God that that's real faith. And yet, that's not what the scripture says. I don't know about you guys, but boy, I tell you, more often than not, I feel weaker than I do stronger. And you know what I've discovered? In those times when I really think I'm strong, I'm actually pretty weak. And those times when I feel really weak and worthless, those are the times when God can use me the most. Those are the times when God's power can be perfected in me. In fact, Paul said this. You see, when Paul prayed multiple times for God to remove what he described as a thorn in his flesh, Jesus answered him and he said this. He said to me, and some of you might be there right now. My grace, my unmerited favor, my love for you that has put this resurrection power in you, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, this resurrection power, is made perfect in weakness. Whew. Well, there's a good study. There's a good small group Bible study or good devotion. Therefore, Paul says this, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ then I am, listen to this, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities because when I am weak, 
That's when I'm really strong. I am content. Are any of you there yet? Man, I'll tell you, I'm not. Speaking of weaknesses, hardships, calamities, this leads us right into the next way that Paul tells us we can experience Christ. Not only can we experience him personally, not only can we experience him powerfully, oh boy, this is a toughie. (laughs) We can experience him painfully. How many of you know we live in a fallen world, in a very imperfect world? How many of you know that the person sitting next to you is very imperfect? Can I hear amen? No, just kidding. <laughs> we all are imperfect, aren't we? Even with Christ's resurrection power living with us, we live in a fallen world that's falling apart. Notice in Philippians 3.10, The next way that Paul describes how he wants to know and experience Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. We love that. (laughs) I do. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You know, it's, it's one thing to experience Christ personally and powerfully, but it's quite another thing to want to know him in your pain. But this is exactly what Paul is advocating. You see, Paul was not only willing to reign with Christ, he was also willing to suffer with him. Paul was well aware of how Christ suffered. And when he came to believe in Jesus on the road to Damascus, there's a little interesting tidbit that sometimes we overlook or forget about Saul who became Paul. When Saul encounters Christ, he went blind for three days. Jesus instructed him to go into Damascus and wait there. And so he does. Meanwhile, the Lord spoke to a man by the name of Ananias in a vision and instructed him that he was to go and place his hands on Saul so that he would receive his sight. Ananias resists. He says, well, hold on, Lord. I know, this. I know about this guy. This guy has been going around putting your followers in prison. Interestingly enough, listen to what the Lord says to Ananias in Acts 9.15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Now, I know a lot of preacher friends of mine that love that part. He's like, I'm going to be famous. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. Before kings and, 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 and gen, the Gentiles and, and before the people of Israel. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. And yet, verse 16 says, and this is Jesus talking to Ananias about Paul. He's my chosen instrument. He's going to be before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. And here it is. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. I don't know about you guys, but I, I have to confess that when I came to Christ, I, I don't remember signing up for that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't remember, yeah, the, I didn't think that was part of the deal. <laughs> and had Jesus revealed to me all the hurt that I would experience, all the hits that I would take and all the suffering that I would encounter, I'm not so sure I would have wanted to sign up. And yet, here's Paul, who's essentially saying, if through suffering I can know him better, then bring it on. (sighs) Jesus stepped down from heaven. He came to this earth and became a servant knowing all along that he would suffer and be sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. And for Jesus, if becoming a servant, suffering painful agony and sacrificing himself on the cross meant that we could come to know him, then he too essentially said, bring it on. Some of you, you're there right now. You're struggling. Can I I just... Let you in on another little secret. 
It's not a sin to struggle. Struggle can be a good thing. Suffering, if it brings you closer to Christ, can be a very good thing. You see, there is suffering that comes from living in this fallen world that befalls every one of us. No one is exempt. In fact, I'm convinced that the closer you, do, you are to Christ, the more spiritual you are, you'll probably suffer more. That was the case with Paul. I've heard, I've heard friends say, I, I'm praying that God will make me like Paul. It's like, whoo, <laughs> watch out for that one. <sighs> yeah. None of us are exempt and none of us escape the fallenness. It's why the scriptures earlier, Paul tells the Philippians, he says, don't be anxious, don't worry. Instead, pray. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding, it'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peter would go on to say, cast all your cares on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. But there's another type of suffering that the Bible speaks about that might be unfamiliar to a lot of us. It's suffering for the sake of the gospel. And i got to tell you, if this world continues in the path of calling evil good and good evil, then don't be surprised if we, like so many others who have gone before us, are called to suffer for the sake of, God, of the gospel. And I pray to God that through his strength, I can say, bring it on. Paul says, he talks about this pain of of suffering for the gospel, but he also talked about becoming like him in his death. When it comes to experiencing Christ painfully, Paul says, yes, I want to become like him in his death. Now, how do you do that? How do you become like Christ in his death? Well, there could be a literal crucifixion that Paul could undergo. I mean, that happened to a lot of the apostles, didn't it? In fact, we are told that Peter was crucified like Jesus. But before he was crucified, he asked to be crucified upside down because he did not deem himself worthy to be crucified like his Lord and Savior. But I think also, not only could a literal cruci crucifixion be evident, but I think there's a spiritual crucifixion that we can experience every day. In the book of Romans, Paul goes to great lengths to describe how we as believers are to count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Paul would, would tell the, the, the Galatians, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus suffered and died and this is not the fun part, and I don't hear a lot of preaching on this, but friends, believers, you and I are called to suffer, and we are called to take up our cross and follow him daily. Well, there's one more way that this passage, that Paul says in this passage that we can experience Christ, and that's not only personally, it's not only powerfully, and it's not only painfully, but I love this last one. We can experience him permanently. Paul's desire to know and experience Christ culminates in these two verses by stating that ultimately he wants to attain to the resurrection of the dead, to be with Christ throughout eternity. I don't know about you, but I'm signing up for that one, right? One, but, but how does that happen? How does a person attain to the resurrection of the dead? One of the most popular opinions that, that I hear a lot goes something like this. You know, as long as I'm a good person, and as long as kind of my, my good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, I'm in, right? I mean, I'm not an ax murderer or anything like that. Um, that, that. That counts for something. I mean, that kind of sounds fair, doesn't it? Well, as we wrap this up this morning, can I share with you what I think 
is one of, if not the most terrifying scriptures in the entire Bible. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. And this is what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone's going to make it. In fact, Jesus would go on to say, there's only going to be a few. Wow. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus would later say, this is my Father's will for you to believe in his one and only Son. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Listen, then I will, pl- t- uh, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. You never knew me. Away, evildoers. Did you catch that last phrase? I never knew you. In other words, the people that Jesus is referring to in this passage are those who do a lot of religious things and think that somehow that will merit heaven for them. And although religious, these people never knew Christ in a personal, experiential way. They knew about him, but they didn't have a relationship with him. They thought they could get there on their own merits. But according to Jesus, that's not enough. There's only one way that people get to heaven and attain to the resurrection of the dead, and it's by knowing Jesus. And by knowing, I mean that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came down from heaven to earth. That he was miraculously born of the Virgin Mary. That he grew up and lived a perfect, sinless life. He never sinned. That he was crucified on the cross willingly. He gave his life. They didn't take him. He gave himself. This was the plan all along where he spilled his blood. And that innocent blood was the payment for the sins of the world. He was buried in the tomb where they laid his body. Three days later, he was raised from the dead. He appeared over a period of 40 days to many people, over 500 at one time. And then on the 40th day, he ascended back up into heaven. And now he offers the forgiveness of sin to all of those who believe in him and promises to take up residence in their life and give them the power of the resurrection and says that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So let me ask you three questions before we go. First question, do you know him? Do you know him? Have you experienced that personal relationship with Jesus by professing your faith and your belief in him? If you've never done that, it very well could be that this morning is your day. And you can do that before you leave. And I'll help you do it. Secondly, are you experiencing him what's your level of experience with him where do you need to grow before you leave today would would you just ask jesus that where do you want me to grow and then lastly are you ready to meet him are you ready to meet him because Here's what I know about every one of us. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen the rest of the day. Jesus could come back and take us home. Or 
he could take some of us home before this day is done. Are you ready to meet him? Would you stand with me? Oh, Father God, thank you. Thank you for men like Paul who showed us and modeled for us and expressed to us how we can know you better and how we can experience you in deeper, on deeper levels. And so first and foremost this morning, Lord, I just pray that, Lord, for those who are here and they've never, ever professed their faith in you and believed in you and received you into their life. And for those of you who are here this morning and you're ready to do that, would you just pray this simple prayer? Jesus, I do believe that you are the Son of God. And this morning, I place my life in your hands. And I accept the free gift of forgiveness of sin. And I invite you to come into my life. In your name I pray. And for those of you who are believers and you would just simply pray this prayer, you'd say, Jesus, where do I need to experience you more? What's my next step with you? How can I know you better? Personally, powerfully, maybe painfully, so that I can be with you permanently. And then lastly, Lord, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Our life is a mist. It appears for a time and then it vanishes. So Lord, may we be about our Father's business. May Pathway Church as a congregation be about seeking and saving the lost in this community, about being ambassadors and servants of Christ for your glory and not ours. And we pray this all in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Did you guys help me take?